Why aren't we as Christians sharing our faith more often? Then when we come to Hebrews chapter 12, and I love this because at the men's breakfast, they were talking about Hebrews 12 and Romans chapter 12. And I thought it was amazing because I'm sitting there thinking they don't even know what I'm going to be preaching on uh, this morning or how I'm going to open up the message this morning. But in Hebrews chapter 12, we read, and I, and I believe personally that Paul wrote the book of Hebrews uh, just from the language that is in there and how he wrote the other epistles of the Bible uh, just makes me think that it was Paul that wrote the, uh, the book of Hebrews. But Paul, and I'm going to say Paul because I really believe he wrote the Hebrews, he shares with us in Hebrews chapter 12 that Jesus Christ um, is the author and he's the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. For the joy that was set before him and endured the cross. And when I understand that verse, I mean, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. Look at your neighbor and say, for the joy, for the joy. And now he's sat down at the right hand of the Father. And I think about that word, joy. And if there's any reason that we should share our faith with other people and evangelize and let them know what Christ has done in our lives, it's for the joy. It's for the joy that God has given to each and every one of us in serving Him and, and being able to uh, do the things that we're able to do. And it's for the joy that we can enjoy worship. You know, not only in our individual lives, but also to come here on Sunday mornings. I don't know about you, but I get up early on Sunday mornings and I begin to pray. I pray before Sunday uh, that God will be with us uh, on Sunday mornings. But when I get up on Sunday mornings, I start specifically praying for what God is going to do when we meet together. And, and, I, and I want us to have a joyful experience of uh, something that when we walk out of here, we realize, man, that was something that you just can't explain what I just experienced. And it's those type of moments that can help you throughout the week. You know, I don't know about you, but how many look forward to Monday mornings? You do? You need to go to the altar when we pray. <laughs> Sunday night, you can just, you can sense Satan to start working already. You know what I'm talking about? And it just, your mind just starts traveling in all kinds of different directions. And when you wake up Monday morning, you're like, where did the weekend go? Uh, but uh, that's the way it is. But I love the opportunity to come in here together because we can enjoy not only our fellowship with one another, but we can enjoy and have the joy of worshiping the Lord together. Amen. And I think we've experienced that this morning, don't you? Amen. I mean, we've had a variety of songs, and next week we're excited about that as well. But let's get into this for just a moment. I know I've probably messed Trevor up so bad this morning, but I'm just oh. sensing God, you know, and, and moving in a different direction. But I want us to understand, a lot of people get mixed up and they talk about, you know, can I worship God through my prayer? Absolutely. You can worship God through your prayer. But I want us to understand the difference between prayer and praise and worship. Okay? Um, and prayer is this. Prayer is my occupation with needs. Prayer is my occupation with needs. Praise is my occupation with blessings. Yes. And worship 
is my occupation with God. Okay? Let me share that with you again. Prayer is the occupation with needs. Praise is my occupation with blessings. And worship is my occupation with God. Let me break that down for you, okay? Prayer is saying, Lord, save me. Okay? That's what prayer is. Prayer is saying, Lord, save me. Praise is saying, thank you, Lord, for saving me. And worship is saying, thank you, Lord, for who you are. Okay? So we understand that now, right? Prayer is saying, Lord, save me. Lord, help me. Okay? And praise is saying, thank you, Lord, for saving me. Thank you, Lord, for helping me. And worship is just saying, Lord, thank you for who you are. Because you are the one that can do what you do in our lives. Let me give you an illustration, and I thought this was so fascinating. There was a tentative building in the city of London that was on fire. And on the top floor of that building lived a young woman. And in the midst of the fire, she was seen standing there by the open window, and she was crying out for help. She was crying out, save me, okay? She was crying out for help. She had been trapped in this building by the flames, and there seemed at that moment in her life that there was no way out. Her situation at that time, at that very moment, did seem hopeless. Until a young, brave fireman, who was encouraged by some of his buddies, he took a long, risky trip up a ladder at the last moment and he was able to pull her out of the window of this flaming building and he rescued her from certain death in the excitement of her rescue this young lady forgot to say thank you to this young fire so the next day she sought out his name and not only his name she sought out his address and she got in touch with him by virtue of the phone and he called her back. And they had quite an interesting conversation. So they ended up having dinner together. And they became very good friends. In fact, they fell in love. And later on, they got married. And the woman said that she never allowed herself to ever forget that this fireman had saved her. And that if it had not been for him, she would have been burned to death. But now, he had become to her far more than a savior. Now he was her husband, he was her lover, he was her lifelong friend. Now you think about that story, and you think about our relationship with God. I'm sure that you can see the connection here. Just as we have cried out to God in our prayer, Lord, save me. And when he has come along and he's done that, we have said, thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Now we have come to him and we are getting to know him intimately. We're getting to know him more. And we know him more and intimately through our worship. And as something far more than our Savior, he is our lover, our friend, our companion day by day. And we have come to worship Him and enter into His presence and enter into virtue of worship. Thank you, Lord, for being to me who you truly are. That's where we are. There's a law in the study of interpretation in the Bible which is sometimes called the law of first mention. The law is quite an interesting study for anyone who is serious about learning more of the Word of God. Because the law of first mention basically says that whenever you find a doctrine or a word or a theme mentioned in the Bible for the very first time, that first time it is mentioned, you can understand it in such a way that is different than once you start looking throughout the Bible for that word or that theme or that doctrine. And the more you learn about that word or that theme or that doctrine, the more you understand what it truly means. 
And that's what you have here. The law of first uh, mention. It's set right before us. Is that true when it's first mentioned of worship in the Bible? And it ought to be an interesting thing to us. Actually, the Hebrew word is found, if you go to Genesis 18, it's found there. The first mention, as I said, the law of first mention, is found in Genesis chapter 18, where Abraham is entertaining three strangers, and the scripture says in verse 2, in verse 2 of this, So he lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, three men were standing by him, and when he saw them, he ran from his tent door to meet them. And here it is right here, the first mention. And he bowed himself to the ground. The Hebrew word for bowed himself to it is worship. Okay? So here's the first mention of it in uh, Genesis chapter 18 and verse 2. This is when the angels uh, uh, met up with Abraham. And he recognized it. And he began to worship. That's the first mention as we understand it. But if we go to Genesis chapter 22, in which David read for us earlier, and you look at verse 5, the word, the English word, worship, is where it's first mentioned there. And Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey and the lad, and I will go yonder and watch her. And worship. And we will come back to you. Now think about that for just a moment, all right? Here Abraham and Sarah had waited all these years for Isaac to come along. Abraham was promised by God that through Isaac, his people would be saved. His people would uh, go on and flourish and become a great nation through Isaac. Now here's the thing. They waited. Now Sarah was 100 years old. <coughs> When she gave birth to Isaac. You think about that for just a moment. All right? A hundred years old when she gave birth to him. And here, all of a sudden, God comes to Abraham and he says, Abraham, I want you to take this young uh, man that I've given to you. I want you to take him up on a mountain that I'm going to name later and, and direct you up there. And I want you to sacrifice him for me. Now, if you think about that, when that comes to us, and you think about verse 5, when the Abraham looks at those servants and he says, listen, me and Isaac are going to go up and we're going to worship God. Now, think about that for just a moment in this. That's where I want to get to. The law of first mention. And from that point on, the word worship becomes so powerful, it becomes uh, and in such a meaningful way that you and I can understand. First of all, worship recognizes that God has spoken. Amen? Amen? It recognizes that God has spoken. And in Genesis chapter 22, in verses 1 and 2, uh, as we've already learned earlier um, on this subject of worship, worship is a command from God. It is a command from God. He has commanded it. It's not an option. To us as believers. Here we see God in direct communication with Abraham in these first two verses of Genesis chapter 22. Let's look at them again in what David has read for us in verses 1 and 2. Can we pull that up? There we go. Now it came to pass after these things that God, what church? He tested Abraham and he said to him, Abraham, and he said, here am I. Verse 2, then he said, take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering of one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. Now, here God has spoken, right? And he wants Abraham to do this. This is a commandment to Abraham to go and worship. He's actually telling him where to worship in this place and how he is to worship. This experience that Abraham is about to get is something, not something that uh, is thought up, okay? This is not something that Abraham imagined. This is God's idea. Let me say that as clearly as I can. This is God's idea here in this, on this, all right? So, worship is God's idea. It is. 
And it's not something that we have decided to do in order that we can figure out how from the very beginning of the service of the, to the message and from the message to the end of the service. Worship is the idea born in the heart of God. It is, it is God's very own passion. All right? So we have to understand. In fact, if you take Abraham's obedience to God out of the story, if you take Abraham's obedience to God in this story, out of the story, what do you have, church? You have premeditated murder. That's what you have if you take uh, his obedience out of this. If, if Abraham is simply going to go up to the mountain and kill his son, then there is nothing godly about it. And it's going to uh, create the most uh, heinous act recorded in the Old Testament. But in the response to an almighty God who has instructed Abraham in the act of uh, or sacrifice of worship, it becomes a holy ground to all who understand worship. It is important for us to remember, and we shall be reminded of it often during this series of study, that the worship of God and the work of God are always guided by the Word of God. Okay? The worship of God and the work of God are always guided by the Word of God. Worship recognizes that God has spoken. But secondly, worship responds to what God has said. If you look at Genesis chapter 22 and verse 3 again, you, you read here, Abraham rose early in the morning, and he saddled his donkey, and he took two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son, and he, and he split the wood of the burnt offering, and he arose and went to the place which God, what church, had told him to. Now, so often we will tell these stories, and we read them from the Old Testament, and we get caught up in what we call the Old Testament setting, and we miss the impact of what truly is going on with God. Let me ask you a question. What would you expect me to do as the pastor of Emmanuel Baptist Church if one day God directly asked me to take, and I'm going to use this as an example, take my grandson, Bentley, who I love dearly, what would you expect me to do if God directly tells me to take Bentley and sacrifice him for worship? What would you expect me to do? Alright? What, what do you think my response would be? I'm just going to be honest with you this morning. And you need to be honest with yourself, alright? I would probably call my mentors and pastor friends to see if maybe I'm not, if maybe I'm interpreting this the wrong way. I would probably ask everybody to get together and say to them, hey, you know what? It really doesn't make sense to me at all. I can't believe that God would even ask me to do such a thing. Then I would probably go back to the Lord and I would say, Lord, give me three or four months to come back with the answer to you and pray about this. But I want you to notice in verse 3, what was Abraham's response? Immediately he rose up the next morning, early the next morning. Why? To be obedient to God. And there was no argument there. There was no negotiating back and forth between Abraham and God. The fact that it did not make any sense to him did, did not keep him from being obedient to what God had said. God clearly told him, this is the way, Abraham, you are to worship me. And he obeyed without any question, without any fight. And the record of this is dear, uh, is very clear in his obedience. God honored him because of his obedience. And he blessed him. In the book of, uh, uh, it's called, it's by Robert Weber. If you've never read this book, Especially if we've been on the subject of worship. You need, to, you need to get this book and read it. It's called Worship is a Verb. And it's a book. And, it, and you need to get this book and you need to read it. I know that's a strange title, right? Worship is a verb. 
Basically, this book was telling me what was that this. Worship is not a feeling. It's not a feeling. It's not a thought process. It is not something that comes over us in a moment of emotion. That is not what worship is. But worship is an activity that we are involved in as a response to what God has asked of us as His people. Worship is an activity that God wants you and me to make a part of our lives. Isn't that amazing? That's what He's talking about. Worship is not passive. It is uh, participative. If you come here on Sunday mornings and you're involved in the worship, you are worshiping. But if you come here Sunday mornings and you don't want to be involved with the worship and you just sit, to, you just sit back there like a bump on a log and don't want to participate, you are not participating in worship. You're allowing everything to happen up here. And that's not what God wants. God wants us to work together and worship Him the way God intends us to worship Him. So here it is. God comes to Abraham and says, Abraham, I want you to take your son and whom you love, and I want you to take him up on the mountain, and I want you to sacrifice him as an act of worship toward me. And Abraham gets up immediately the next morning, and he goes off the table. Now here's another one. Worship requires the best that we have to offer. If you look at verse 2 again, my friends, worship is not a cheap thing. Abraham was asked of God to offer his most prized possession, his own son. This son meant everything to Abraham. This was the son who was going to bring all blessings and promises of God. They were to be fulfilled through Isaac. In essence, what God was saying, this is how much your worship is going to cost you. Take your only son and offer him to me. And someone has suggested that in order for Abraham to obey, he had to surrender three things. And I'm going to go over this real quickly with you. He had to surrender three things, and this is so amazing. Number one, he had to surrender his intellect. He did. He had to surrender his intellect. Because Abraham was caught on the horns of dilemma. It was to Isaac that God had, had pointed and said, In Isaac shall all the promises that I am going to fulfill through him. Abraham, as I said, were older when Isaac came into life. And he was promised to them. And now he says, Take your son that I have promised you up to a mountain, and I want you to kill him. And Abraham's sitting there thinking, wow, you know, he had, to, he had to surrender his intellect. And I couldn't understand this. And I asked you earlier, what would you expect of me if I said here one Sunday morning that God spoke to me and he wants me to sacrifice my grandson? I asked you that. You see, we have to surrender our intellect. And I was thinking, how in the world was Abraham so... Um, uh, uh, free to get up the next morning and, and do all that he was doing and even take Isaac up to the mountain to offer him a sacrifice. Then it hit me, ladies and gentlemen, this hit me like it's never hit me before. And I found this. I want you to see this. In Hebrews chapter 11, we're back to Hebrews, but in chapter 11, we find the answer to that in verses 17 through 19. And when you read this, you understand what's going on. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, and we read that in Genesis, right? God tested him. He offered up Isaac, and he, uh, and he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, and Isaac your seed shall be called, concluding that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from which he has also received him in a few sense. What does that verse say? It says this. Abraham, when he was asked to do this, had faith in God to say, okay, God, you've promised me that through Isaac that all of these promises would come true and you would bless our nation. Now you're asking me to take him 
an offering up as a sacrifice of worship to you. So I, by faith, God, I'm assuming when I take his life up on that mountain, you are going to raise him up from the dead. Glorify you. Wow. That's faith. That is unbelievable faith. It was going to cost him his very own son that he loved. But he had enough faith in God to say, if I sacrifice him the way that you're asking me to sacrifice him, then I'm believing in you that you will raise him from the dead to fulfill what you said you want to do. That's amazing. Does that sound familiar? God loves you and I so much that he gave his only son as a sacrifice of worship to him in our behalf. And Amy sung it so beautifully of what the cross is. The cross is your penalty and my penalty taken to it and nailed there. They didn't take Jesus' life. He gave his life willingly as a sacrifice knowing that once his life is taken, three days later, he will rise from the dead. Again. And the resurrection of his life gives us the life that we have today. And the hope of that. You see, people want to, they want to, they want to celebrate Passover weekend. And I'm going to tell you something. When Jesus entered into Jerusalem, a week from being crucified on the cross. They had palm branches out. They were crying out, Hosanna, Hosanna. They were worshiping God in their own way as he was entered in. How did he enter in, ladies and gentlemen? He entered in on a donkey. He entered in humbly, knowing what was going to take place. They weren't going to take his life. He was laying his life down willingly. He was ready to be offered as a sacrifice of praise because he knew that in three days he would raise from the dead in such a powerful way. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm thankful for the cross. Amen? Aren't you thankful for the cross? I'm thankful for the cross. We've been a part of this drama that's going on at Landmark, and that scene never gets old to see the crucifixion of Christ. And I'm so thankful for the cross, but it's far beyond the cross. If you don't have the resurrection of Christ and you only have the cross, then we're still there at the cross. Amen? And there's not the hope in the life that we have. But thank God He raised from the dead after three days. And His life gives us our life today. And it's so powerful and I'm so thankful for that. And Abraham saw that. He saw that. He said, man, He has to bring my son back to life. For these promises to come true. He believed in that. So he had to give up his intellect. Number two, he had to give up his will. He could have understand what he could have understood what God said. He could have comprehended all of that and then, but until he took the first step toward Mount Moriah, he had not begun to worship God. And Abraham had to surrender all that in order that he might worship. Can I say this? We have made worship. We have made worship so frivolous. We have made worship so easy. We have made light of worship. And you know, one of the things that I think those of us who are involved in trying to direct the church, one of the things that, that we are concerned with is that sometimes our image of worship has been so tarnished. Because we have watched it, we have watched what supposedly worship is, and it seems so so unplanned and so lacking in excellence, so not what we would expect to bring God. And we look at that and we think, is that where we're going? I want to tell you that that is not where we're going with this. And I want to ease your mind with that. Um, during this, this drama, if you come out, if you've been out and watched it or you want to watch it, um, you have this buildup of the crucifixion and Christ is put into uh, the grave and, 
And even though you know the story and even though you know what's about to happen, when Christ comes out of that tomb victoriously, it just lifts your spirit up. And I'm backstage getting ready to come out and sing, and I'm hearing the crowd going crazy when he comes out. That's worship. You know, that's being excited about, about what Christ has done. And saying, Lord, thank you for who you are. Thank you for who you are and what you've done in our lives. The second thing, I'm sorry, I, I went over top of it. He, he had to sacrifice his emotions, and then he had to sacrifice his will. That was those things there. Let me bring this to a close. David, in 2 Samuel chapter 24, do you realize that David went back to that same place where Abraham offered Isaac up? as a sacrifice. If you don't know the story, here it is. Abraham and Isaac go on up the hill. And David and Isaac looks at, at Abraham and he says, Father, we got the wood, we got the fire, we got everything we need except the lamb. What's up with that? And Abraham's he's so focused. He says, Isaac, God will provide. That's focus. And he gets up there and he lays Isaac down and he's drawing back to take Isaac's life and right at the nick of time, God intervenes. He says, well, you've taken it as far as I want you to take it. Thank you. Here's the lamb. Can you imagine, and think about this as we close, Abraham's heart and how it was racing, going up the hill, thinking about everything that he's supposed to do, thinking about how's this all going to play out. What's true to Think about how his heart was racing up the hill and how his heart was rejoicing coming down the hill. You think about that for just a moment. The passion of worship. Abraham said, he said, Lord, I've been, I've been telling you, right? It's 100% obedience. Was Abraham not 100% obedient in this moment? Absolutely. It's 100% commitment. Abraham was committed in his passion to worship. He was committed to it. He was devoted to it. And I, and I share with you, that is the passion of worship. And one of the greatest stories that's in the Bible that I truly love is this. Jesus is at, a, he's at Simon's house and they're having dinner. They're just going about doing the business. Jesus has been with his disciples telling them, hey, I got it. I have to die in a few days here. What? I have to die in a few days. I'm just let you know that. But on the third day, I'm going to rise again. But Lord, what about the kingdom? What about all the... No, I'm just telling you, I have to die and I have to go away. And they're minding their own business and they're talking and all of a sudden, the door breaks open and here comes Mary with this expensive perfume. And she didn't care who was in that room. In her mind's eye, the only person that was in that room was Jesus Christ. She wanted to worship, the passion of worship, what God laid on her heart to do. She went to Jesus and she laid herself down at his feet and she stood up and she broke that perfume and poured it on his head. And all the way down, she just wiped Jesus off with her hair tears. The passion of worship. They were all, man, that's expensive. What are you doing? We could have used that for something. Jesus said in Mike Botts' language, shut up. <laughs> Just shut up. She's doing what she's supposed to be doing in the moment that she still has time to do. 
she's worshiping me. Which you ought to be doing. Instead of worrying about this and worrying about that. You see? That's what God desires. That's what he desired the God of Abraham. Abraham, how far do you want to take this? I'm testing you. Do you truly love me? Are you passionate about worshiping me? Then here's what I want you to do. How far will you take that? And I would say Abraham passed the test. I would say he passed the test. And I thank God that he gave the sacrifice in the place of Isaac. Aren't you? Yes. That replacement for Isaac. Isaac represents us. Our replacement for sacrifice is Jesus Christ. Do you know him today? Do you know him intimately and passionately? Bow your hands.